Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to Nautel's Transmission Talk Tuesday. Today we're talking about single frequency networking. What's the frequency, Kenneth? Anyway, uh, bad song jokes. We're going to blame one of my guests for this because he was telling dad jokes earlier and uh, really got me in the in the frame of mind. And uh, this is going to be, for some of you all, this is going to be a long hour. I'll apologize in advance. But on that note, I want to welcome the handsome and talented Kirk Harnack from Telos Alliance. Kirk, welcome aboard and glad to have you with us. Hey, hi, Jeff. Good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Good to see you. My pleasure. Now, you, you were talking about uh, your your relationship with your easy chair early on, and uh, that that one uh, that one kind of kind of surprised me a little. There, there's a reason I have a full time job at the Telus Alliance, and and not uh, yeah, not not a job uh, on on the comedy circuit because I'd starve. Uh, pr pretty sure you won't see me on Comedy Central anytime soon. On a more serious vein, well, not more serious. I've heard him crack a joke or two. Also, we've got our own chief technology officer, Mr. Philip Schmidt, with us today. Hello, it's a uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Now, now, Philip, uh, on a less humorous note, uh, Philip had to uh, was worried he wasn't going to make it because he was doing mandatory first aid training. They told him they weren't going to let him in the building if he didn't uh, learn how to do first aid or something like that. I forget exactly how it went. Uh, it's the threat, yep. <laughs> But, uh, and, and that does come back to our uh, overall safety uh, infrastructure. We do uh, tend to actually like to try and keep the folks we work with around as long as possible. So today we are talking about single frequency networking and mandatory housekeeping stuff first. Uh, there is a place to ask questions. I do have on the little magical... By the way, if anybody's got a Samsung phone and it's uh, throwing up any apps on you and not working right, uh, there is an update to the uh, uh, web app. So um, just uh, take a little, do a little Google for that. I spent an enjoyful hour this morning trying to get my phone working. You don't know how much you rely on it until it's not functioning. Let's put it that way. So type in your questions. Uh, we'll answer them as we go, or I'll slide them in wherever they're appropriate. Um, if you want to contribute to the conversation, you got the little hand wavy icon, click on that, and we're more than happy to unmute your mic and uh, make you part of the conversation. I know from the advanced questions, there was uh, quite a bit of interest and in some, some things uh, put up there. So I think we're going to have a little bit of fun today. So single frequency networking, that's the, the concept of... Uh, putting two transmitters on the same frequency near each other on purpose. And uh, Kirk, you've been doing this radio thing for quite a while as an engineering guy, as a marketing guy, as, as a, on one side of the mic and the other. Um, why, why would you ever want to put two signals on the same <laughs> frequency together like that? Well, you, you know, if you're an owner, hey, if one station is good, two must be twice as good, right? <laughs> or... Or maybe you have a desire to cover a uh, a large marketplace, and you just can't afford a large marketplace radio station. So uh, I remember one time years ago, I was um, um, let's see, if, if any, I'm, I won't mention any names, but I, I'll try not to even mention any markets. Uh, the you can guess the preamble to the conversation, but the final statement, the one that kind of got me in trouble and made the owner not like me so much, was uh, I said. Um, if you want to own and run and make money from a big city radio station, maybe you need to buy a big city radio station and not one that's licensed literally 78 miles away uh, because he was trying to rim shot from 78 miles away. And there are a few occasions where that would work, but, it, but not that one. So the, the idea there of a single frequency network is that it may be in some, some of the larger metropolitan areas, Chicago, mm -hmm. Boston, I'm sure others, um, you can find, you know, a class A FM station that's out a bit, right? But, but you know, horns in a little bit. And then a few miles away, you can find another class A on the same frequency because they're fully separated and it kind of horns in a bit. And, mm -hmm. and you, you build a ring of these stations around a market and pretty soon you, you kind of cover the market for a lot less money than buying 100 kilowatt in downtown big city USA. Right. And there are a couple of... Uh couple of uh, ideas for different ways that you can uh, sort of maximize that and improve that. We're going to talk to, to Philip about some cool stuff that he's played with over the years as well. 
Um, so that is one situation. I had another one. Uh, a lot of folks may remember, oh, many years back now. This and this was my first introduction to single frequency networking, sort of a baptism by fire. Uh, there was a 2,000 foot tower in Eau Claire, Wisconsin that came down during an ice storm. And at the top of that 2,000 foot tower was a 100 kilowatt station, which was one of our customers. And they called and they said, what can we do? And so we got them the fastest transmitter we get out the door was a five kilowatt. Well, that's a, a significant drop in power. So their secondary market, which was next city over, was not getting covered by this I say peanut whistle. I mean, it was still a significant, you know, it, it was uh, a lot better than a one kilowatt into a single bay, but uh, but it, it wasn't what they were hoping for. And what we ended up doing, they got a uh, STA to put a 20 kilowatt fill in booster over their secondary market. And uh, we tied the two of them together. And, and the only requirement, and this was where it was beautiful, the only overlap zone that we had to mess with was I 94. So, you know, our, our concern, our window of concern was roughly 200 feet wide. Um, it, it was a whole lot better than some of the stuff we're going to discuss in the, the next few slides here. But, uh, but there's a, another one. And um, so, Philip, uh, as I said, I, I stole several pages uh, from uh, one of your presentations from a few years ago, one of your NAB papers on HDSFN, which we'll also talk about. But... Uh, this slide really kind of caught my eye. I mean, when you drive through a large market, it's high, hard to find a frequency. Yeah, and, and we have customers that are exactly in that situation. They have a blind spot due to terrain shielding. They cannot cover a certain community, whatnot. And in theory, you know, if frequency was available, a translator would do. Uh, but a lot of times, the frequencies are simply not there or hard to get. Mm. So the only thing you have to play with is your own. And, and there's a, a lot of things you can do there. And this was another situation that you'd outlined, going back to what Kirk was talking about, when you can't afford a big city radio station, sometimes several small town radio stations tightly linked together will accomplish the same end for a whole lot less money. Yeah, so, and the big thing, the interfering contour of those little, little guys will be a lot less than a comparable one with a bigger transmission. Right. So to illustrate this a little bit, I sat down with a with well with Google Maps and uh, Paint because I'm high tech like that. And uh, so in my infinite amount of spare time, I play at a, a community station down the road from where I live. And uh, so this is where our transmitter site is. That's our nominal coverage area. That's the area where if I'm driving in my car and I tuned to 88.7, I can usually get Cove FM. And I say usually because there are a few areas where I won't get Cove FM. Uh, to the west or west northwest, east northeast, sorry, toward Halifax, where you start getting into the buildings, um, right behind my house, almost uh, just to the uh, northwest of the transmitter site, there's a big hill. Um, Phillip's local, so... Uh, He'll, he'll be uh, familiar with Labrador Lookoff, but um, anything beyond that. Now, fortunately, in that area, it's mostly all woods and trees. But again, we've got a blind spot there. And then to the um, southwest, there's a ridge on a peninsula that blocks an area. So these are the areas where I already know from experience that our signal is less than optimal. And it's like, well, we could put a couple of boosters now. I'm thinking that somebody might have an issue if I tried to drop a co-channel booster into downtown Halifax just because of the competition. Um, Philip, you work a lot with, well, you both work with Canadian broadcasters probably more than I do. Um, but is that ever a situation where you would have like uh, folks, I guess, opposing the uh, application, not for an interference uh, concept, but more for a competition type situation? Uh, certainly, I mean, it's a competitive market for sure. You can certainly expect these sort of things, but uh, I mean, the rules are that you have to stay within your own protected contour. You have to stay within your in, in your own backyard, so to speak. Uh, so, I mean, in theory, th th there shouldn't be much argument against it, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, certainly there will always be people that will uh, say nay. Right. 
And in my case, like I drew the Mickey Mouse ears outside of my uh, outside of my circle. Theoretically, I could move them inside the circle. And if I made the one on the Halifax side small enough, I could fill in that gap in the western end of the city without uh, getting into the area where, where my own signal is, is decent. But uh, for us, obviously, we're a little community station with a one kilowatt radiated power that's that's just not our market. Our market is the smaller towns around here, so so that works out quite well. Um, now, and uh, Kirk, you were talking about this before, and I know you you've spoken to him at length about it. Uh, Grady Moats in Boston, and I see Shane's on here, and I think uh, Shane may have been uh, at, at least tangentially involved. Uh, and I'm not going to let Shane talk too much about the competitor product that they used in that situation. But uh, Shane, I'm going to open your mic and uh, get you to tell us a little bit about that particular situation. Let's see how long it takes Shane to go green. And Shane, of course, is now sitting yeah, there going, me, whoa, wait. caught me off guard there. Let's see. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we, uh, you know, it's it's interesting that, uh, that you guys are talking about this today because I did. I just had a, a very similar situation. And no, I won't talk about the product, but I will talk about the concepts <laughs> where um, where we had a a major market in Boston. In this case, the main the transmitter is actually quite some distance away from you know the the actual market of Boston, and there are a couple of little suburbs in there as well that you know weren't covered very well for uh, for a variety of reasons. So uh, we set up a three booster network actually um, still within the contour of that uh, of that main signal but uh, in areas where you know where the coverage wasn't quite as great just due to terrain or various other reasons uh, and it was actually synchronized with uh, with HD and with uh, the analog audio and, uh, and the end result was you know we had we now had HD and uh, and coverage uh, where we where we didn't have it before it's especially important where you've got multiple HD services like HD two and three. So, mm -hmm. And that's one we will talk now. This one, uh, and, and we, that, let's see, I don't see any of my bosses online. So uh, if they are their bosses, plug your collective ears, but that that's, uh, that's a Gates Air system. Yes, Shane? Yes, it is. It's the um, MPX. Okay, if I said it first, you're allowed to agree. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the MPXP codex basically uh, are the uh, the solution there. So, mm -hmm. and I mean, and, and again, it uh, a lot of it comes down. See, all of us, pretty much anybody, I think, any current transmitter, you can synchronize the uh, the carrier and the pilot with GPS. That that's pretty basic. I mean, sure. it's so, pro ten. Yeah, in in this case, I suspect it would work with. Uh, you know, with other manufacturers as well, with the you know the real synchronization seems to be happening in the mostly in the codex themselves, carrying the analog and the and the bitstream together. And so. and that's where it becomes more critical. And and Kirk, that's I'm going to throw this back at you a little bit because I know with uh, with micro MPX and MPX nodes, you've uh, you guys have made some advances there. Um, what do they say? There's always more that can be done, but uh, but but you've gone gone away toward that sort of situation, haven't you? Well, when you distribute anything by IP, you always do have uh, a, a bit of slop because there, there's a, typically a receive buffer at the receive end. So what we're talking about here with, you mentioned micro MPX, and that's uh, uh, having a, an audio processor and stereo generator at a central location, and then uh, taking the composite or the multiplex signal. Now, this would not include HD. This is the multiplex signal up to and including RDS, and uh, uh uh, running that into a codec, and there's a codec uh, called Micro MPX. That, that, by the way, I should say you can trans, you can sample and transport a full composite MPX signal at several megabits per second. Uh, if you don't do any coding to it, there's a couple tricks you could play, but you can get that signal into uh, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four megabits per second. So it, it's not undoable uh, at uh, if you just sample it and send it linearly. The, a lot depends on just how much you're sampling. Um, kind of like the old, do you remember the old Catlink product uh, that would uh, send your composite over a T1 uh, mm -hmm. at one point, you know, four, six, four, whatever it was, megabits per second. Anyway, um, there's a, a, a codec that's called micro MPX. And a lot of folks still haven't heard about micro MPX. Um, micro MPX is a codec that is designed for an MPX signal. And here's the thing, it is not 
a psychoacoustic codec. It it doesn't code things or doesn't throw things away based on what you think it can't hear. So, uh, you know, a lot of folks ask me, well, you know, how does it, how do the different bit rates affect the way it sounds? Well, not very much. Uh, Micro MPX is a codec that is a purely mathematical codec, but there are tricks that are done to get the bit rate down to something reasonable. So, uh, and since, you know, if, if all internet connections everywhere were fiber optic, right, to the transmitter side, everywhere you went, if, if we have, you know, great bandwidth, then you kind of don't need a codec. You can easily send, you know, three, four, five megabits per second to your transmitter sites over IP and, and, and recover your whole multiplex signal at the transmitter site. But because many, uh, right now, the internet, you know, isn't always supportive of that everywhere you want to go. I've got transmitter sites, for example, that are on a wireless ISP. Works fine, but, you know, not at a constant three, four, five, six megabits per second. So right. uh, micro MPX, uh, again, it's a not a psychoacoustic codex, purely mathematical. And interestingly, the, the few compromises that it makes puts distortion in areas that are going to be filtered out of the FM signal anyway. So what you actually end up with at the transmitter site when you receive this micro MPX uh, uh, stream at anywhere from 320 to about 600 megabits per, uh, excuse me, kilobits, kilobits per second, you can set it, you can set it within a range. Uh, when you receive it, the decoder heavily filters out stuff that you don't want in the FM composite anyway, like uh, on either side of the pilot and between the pilot and the L minus R and between the L minus R and the RDS and then above the RDS. So the distortion products that occur in micro MPX get filtered out anyway. So you get a really super clean signal. In fact, Mike Modney, in, also in Canada, uh, has done some spectrographs of this. And uh, you know, over a composite STL, an analog composite STL, micro MPX will give you anywhere from a 35 to 40 dB better noise floor than shooting a composite, a typical analog composite STL. Okay, that said, so now we can move MPX to the transmitter site uh, over a, a, a you know half a megabit, 500 kilobits per second, let's just say as an average uh, signal. And that includes a little bit of forward error correction too. So if you do have a drop packet, the decoder can reconstruct it because there's forward error correction going on. Now, with that said, now we're delivering by IP a clean multiplex FM signal to the transmitter site that we decode and we've got coming out of a BNC connector, uh, an FM composite signal at that point. And then we wanna put that on, on the air. To your question about, about timing and synchronization, uh, you, you may have heard something I haven't heard yet because you've a couple of times you've alluded to a, a timing correction that I haven't heard of yet. So maybe I, maybe I need to get back in touch with our developers. But uh, for a, what I would say a little bit of a sloppy single frequency network, this is a great technique. When you have terrain shielding or or legal uh, uh, mileage separation between you know fully spaced FM stations, but you they're on the same frequency and you want the same audio on them, and you've got not a whole lot of overlap anyway, this is a great technique to deliver that, that same MPX to both sites or all three sites or all 10 sites, whatever it may be, uh, yeah. And they're they're pretty well aligned, and we can go more into that in that later. There's more to the story. Yeah, and uh, I'll talk uh, a little bit later on too about uh, some stuff that Digidea, a company we just acquired, has been doing similar oh. to that. Um, now Shane mentions that he's been testing micro MPX because, of course, Shane has a lab with all the cool toys that the rest of us only wish we had. <laughs> Um, and uh, mentioning that he's running micro MPX from an Omnia 9S install running on Amazon Web Services to his lab, and it works well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's uh, again whether you know whether you're running it in a lab or in a transmitter site, uh, it's a lot less of a concern than it used to be not too many years ago. Uh, by the way, Shane also said that you uh, gave him a flashback with the Catlink reference. So, uh, <laughs> I think flashback. next time you see him, you're going to have to buy Maybe him. You'll probably still be twitching. But maybe it's yeah, PTSD. By the way, you Jeff, you said something rather quickly, and I, I think maybe we want to expound on it just just a touch. And that is, you said Omnia 9x running in Amazon Cloud. Huh? Mm -hmm. This is an a, this is the full Omnia 9 FM audio processor, uh, and you can have HD in there too, and the stereo generator, and it can put out micro MPX all running up in a cloud instance. So. Yep. You know, maybe your automation system in the cloud, maybe it's not, whatever, uh, this processor running in the cloud. And it, of course, people will say, well, how do I get 
FM composite from the cloud to my transmitter site. With, that's what micro MPX is for. And you can do it over a uh, dual path. So if right. you're worried about, you know, if you have two paths, two IP paths to your transmitter site, maybe an IP radio link, maybe mm -hmm. internet service from fiber, cable, DSL, whatever, there you go. You got two paths. And, yep. and, it's, um, and you, you have uh, packet by packet replacement if there's lost packets. And by the same token, if you've got a proper managed switch, you can, uh, you know, you can build automatic switching in there. So you lose one path that uh, just defaults to the other one. So yeah, cool stuff. So we've talked about fringe boosters. And uh, then, like I say, the FX3 I've got shown here would be a fill-in booster. That one presents a much bigger challenge because in an overlap area, if you control the overlap, then you can minimize the area of interference. But in a situation like this, and, and Philip, I'll, I'll get you to talk to this a little bit, you've pretty much got uh, an overlap on the entire circumference of the fill-in booster. Right, exactly. Wherever the you know, receiver will see equal power received from uh, FX3 in your terminology there and the main transfer, that's where you have potential interference. So first of all, we need to figure out you know, how big does that differential need to be? And for FM, you know, it's the same as co-channel interference to, to a large degree, and we're looking at around 20 dB, or, you know, if the receiver receives as much as 1% from the undesired transmitter, you will have a degradation in your audio quality. So it's a very large differential. Now, one thing to highlight, if you operate in mono, not stereo FM, it gets a lot easier, mm. uh, because the mono FM signal is a lot more robust, uh, it can handle multipath much better, which this really is multipath. It's two signal sources at the receiver. In this case, it just happened to come from two different transmitters, rather than a bounce off a building. Uh, but it's really the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go into mono, it's a lot more resilient signal, and your DU ratios can be reduced quite a bit. Uh, so that makes it easier. But certainly, that's not an option for a lot of stations out there. Right. Um, the interesting thing, and we'll get into that later. Once you get into HD. Um, the interference zone gets a lot smaller, and not only that, your timing requirements increase. So in a digital transmission, SFNs do become feasible, uh, but the, 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 the limiting factor is still the FM planning parameters uh, right. if you uh, operate a hybrid system. And the important thing to mention is that you can't change the physics. Uh, I mean, you can set this signal so that... Uh, the the signal arrives at this point at this time but it's going to arrive at this point at a different time so you know you can't make the same signal hit two different points at the same time right and so that, that that's my really really bad explanation of why uh why the overlap zones are, are such an issue especially in analog now but in hd and uh, i know we're going to cover it again later because i put the slide in there but uh, you can have a little bit of offset between the two and they'll still lock in, correct? Exactly, and it can be seamless. I've got um, a question for, for Phil yeah. on that topic. Uh, yeah. With uh, with an analog FM transmission, um, each, each, uh, each signal as received, uh, let's say you're receiving two signals and they're less than 20 dB different in your receiver and despite some capture ratio, the receiver is simply receiving the sum of these two signals, which may be disparate in time. And each signal does not carry with it any metadata about when it's supposed to be played uh, or the order in which it's supposed to be played. In other words, it's it's just these two signals that are mixing uh, right there in the antenna in, in the front end of the radio. Whereas if you're receiving HD and you're receiving some of the same information twice, uh, slightly you know, time different f from each other, there is metadata, there is information, there's timing clock data in that HD that helps, helps, helps the receiver say, no, I'm listening to this one, to this one, to this one, to this one. Oh, that one's gone. I'll listen to this one, to this one, to this one, to this one. So in other words, it's, a, a, it's I'm not sure if self-referencing is, is the right word to say here, but there's information to help the receiver decode the uh, the HD signal that's coming in that maybe has a little problem with quality because it's coming from two places and slightly different time. Am I kind of right on that? Well, you're sort of right. Uh, okay, sort of right. Tell me. Uh, you're right in the fact that there is timing information built into the signal. Unlike FM, that's an analog continuous signal. Right. A digital signal is based on symbols. And that's where your timing information is coming from. So in HD, you, each symbol is 2.9 milliseconds long. 
and then you go on to the next symbol. But during those 2.9 milliseconds, your, essentially your waveform transmits the same information. And then it switches to the next symbol with another set of bits and then another set of bits. In between those symbols, you have what's called a guard interval. Of, uh, in HD, it's, it's about 150 microseconds. Uh, in what so it, with what you're referencing to with the uh, you know, sort of the built-in time tag, if two signal copies or, or signal waveforms arrive at the receiver, as long as they stay within it turns out half that guard interval, 75 microseconds, then uh, there is very little interference even at the same power levels between the two. Uh, now you know we've done some uh, testing in a lab. Uh, there's certainly a little bit of a degree of bit errors that happen when the two signals arrive at exactly the same power levels, but there's enough forward error correction in HD that essentially it's still seamless audio. You don't hear any degradation in audio. So HD is more forgiving to areas of overlap that are not perfectly timed uh, than FM is, because yeah. FM is a continuous signal and HD is divided up into blocks that are separatable, and as long as you're not beyond the overlap, you know, half the guard interval, then the receiver can figure that out pretty well. Exactly, so for okay. analog FM, we're looking at maybe five microseconds. Mm -hmm. Like you need to do your, your flight analysis, time of flight from both transmitters into the, the received field into this FX3 area. Um, and um, you know, if you're within five microseconds, you're probably doing fairly well with FM, but mm -hmm. HD can go up to 75. So it's a, it's a much bigger, bigger window. Now, from a planning point of view, we're recommending maybe stick with 40 microseconds, and that's still feasible. Um, but uh, you know, certainly it's a lot more than what FM allows you. Well, yeah, eight times at the just for the planning process. Now, Dave uh, Reitner just wanted you to uh, clarify that uh, that uh, the the twenty dB difference between the desired and undesired. Uh, yeah. It, it, right. No, I was, I was going to say just uh, clarifying that that is uh, the desired, uh, I guess, terrain shielding or, or the difference in signal level before the receivers have an issue. Or maybe put another way, if any one of the transmissions are, is 20 dB above the other, you don't have to worry about timing. Because That's the one the receiver's going to grab. Exactly. It'll just automatically grab that one. Cap Capture ratio has no problem at 20 dB or, or better, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was one of the uh, writing questions as well, was uh, how, uh, how critical terrain shielding is. And uh, the short answer is the better the terrain shielding, the less you need to worry about the synchronization. If you had a flat Earth, that would, the worst case, sort of, so to speak, then you know that the ratios between the transmissions will slowly fade from one to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, have, if you have a hill in between, you can make that fade from one to the other much more rapid. That, that's right. one way to think. As you're going yeah. up the hill, let's say you know the hill that you mentioned there earlier, Jeff. Um, uh, the uh, what was it called again? I, I, I know it as Castle Rock out there. Yeah, yeah, Labrador Lookoff is what we call it locally. But yeah, that's the one. Right, exactly. As you're going up that hill, you'd get the main transmitter. And then as you go down the hill the other side, you'll get the FX3. And only on the ridge will you have equal power ratio. So that's where the range only helps. It really right. reduces the interference. There and where I've seen this a lot, especially is out west, uh, Utah and different areas like that. And I mean, fill in boosters, you can put one on one side of a, of a ridge, one on the other side of a ridge. And if you cross the top of the ridge doing 70 miles an hour, the, the time that you're in the interference zone is pretty minimal, to say the least. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, you're in a car, I hope. Um, I don't think I've ever run that fast. Even on my best days, I'm trying to come up to a Kirk Harnack level dad joke, and I'm just falling short. No, you know, no but I, <laughs> I, I, I was going to bring up there is a special consideration if whether you're doing an on-channel booster or a single frequency network with fully spaced. Um, because I was just I was just uh, uh, finding out about one of these uh, on the island of Kauai, where where it's difficult to cover the whole island because there's this huge mountain in the middle. It gets more rainfall than most any other place on Earth most years. And there is a, uh, a factor that the public radio stations and the religious stations have to account for. Um, the commercial stations do too, but it goes by a different name. Uh, it's called the MSD interference-free zone. Have you guys heard of the MSD interference-free zone? I so that what this stands for is with a public or, or a religious station, MSD is the most significant donor interference-free zone. 
And it's critical that the uh, that if if the most significant donor, if the MSD lives in an area prone to a great deal of overlap of two signals, you've got to put an on-channel booster probably right next door to the most significant donor. Now, with commercial stations, it has a I'm, now. Unfortunately, I am serious about this. The, their placement of 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 uh, translators, on-channel boosters. This has been a factor at at, uh, at at some stations there. There's also the MSA for commercial stations. That's the most significant advertiser. Okay, so, I always uh, heard of it as the OSO, the Owner Significant Other Clause. <laughs> there, there, there you go, too. Wherever uh, the significant other works, you better be able to pick up the radio station. That's right. <laughs> just just a I'll, small fact. The, the FAA, the FCC doesn't recognize this uh, this factor, but. Uh, you might need but to. But it's there. It, it's it there. is very, very real. Um, so the big things that we talked about so far, I mean, definitely synchronizing carrier and pilot. I, I'd say we we kind of skipped over them because they're uh, they're so easy to do these days with GPS clocking. I mean, you throw a 10 megahertz signal into the transmitter, and I think almost every transmitter built today, most of them anyway, will give you the ability to uh, to provide an external clock. So synchronizing carrier and pilot is one thing, but uh, but the audio has has been a different one. I had asked uh, Herman Zensen from our uh, Digidea office uh, to to attend today, but time zones being what they are and everything, uh, I don't think he was able to make it. So um, Digidea does have these uh, the FM sync and the FM span. Yes, Philip. Span FM. The other way around. Okay, sorry. Span FM is the one to the left. It's essentially a content server that uh, sends the audio to a whole bunch of FM sync decoders. And uh, the cool thing about it is it's timestamped so that you do have much better synchronization of the audio. Um, the downside at this point is I think it only provides an RF output instead of a decoded audio output, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Philip's probably already on top of that. Um, yeah, I'm telling. So I'll let you talk to that just a second or two. I don't want to do too much commercial, and then we'll just flip on forward. Sure. Uh, like I think you've already given a, a very good overview there, Jeff. Um, yeah, like I said, the, the, the unit on the left uh, is the one that would be at the studio, and then uh, you would have however many uh, units on the right uh, to, to all the boosters. Where it's been used a lot in France is for highway projects, uh, where you have many, many little transmitters along a highway. So that's a little bit different than our scenario in the United States or Canada. Um, but uh, essentially, it's the same signal along you know, thousands of kilometers of highway. And uh, they've successfully deployed, I think, uh, hundreds of these, uh, maybe I think as much as 500. Uh, and essentially, one of these boxes on the left can pretty much feed all of them on the right. Um, and uh, they all come out at the right time. There's an offset you can program in to make sure that all the timing works out. Um, and it's been successfully deployed in, in France for sure. Yeah, and the cool thing about it, again, talking about highways, and I say just uh, looking at my own little SFN experience way, way back, was that uh, when you're dealing with a highway, your interference zone is, is pretty narrow relative to, you know, I mean, you don't care if it overlaps as much when once you get off the road, so to speak. So uh, that, that's definitely a benefit. Now, coming back, so so this is, and I maybe probably should have put this slide in a little earlier, but Philip, this is uh, one you did for, for your presentation talking about the, uh, uh, about an analog uh, SFN situation. I'm gonna just click ahead to the interference potential. Uh, do you wanna talk to that for a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is the classical situation where you have a mountain in between a community and uh, your, your main transmitter and you just don't get the signal on, on the backside of that mountain. Um, but, uh, and also in, in this case, if you put, let's say, even a small transmission, uh, you, you might think, you know, 250 watts compared to 25 kilowatts would be negligible, but it's not. Um, you know, by the time the signal drops, drops off in the field, the ratios very quickly become very similar in various areas. Uh, and, you know, the way you can think about that, if you do your planning, and if you normally look at your, your protected versus interfering contour, you know, if you draw those circles over top of one another, that gives you an idea as to where potential interference zones could be. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, that would give you sort of your first area of approximation where, where that could right. be. But the idea really would be that you'd run some RF coverage studies uh, where you look at the signal difference between the two um, and you look at the potential time difference between the two 
And you know, for, for that sort of study, we would certainly recommend um, a, a number of good uh, broadcast uh, engineering companies that, that could provide that analysis. Yeah. Um, but we definitely want to get an idea what inference could be. Well, and to go a step beyond that, if you've got a, a little bit of time, and uh, we'll, this will be our first test to see if Matt's paying attention in the background. Matt's our disembodied voice this week. Um, and if he is, you can uh, throw a link into the chat uh, window for everybody to access. But if you go to our website under support and RF toolbox, we've got a coverage map there that our coverage tool that uses uh, Longley Rice, uh, and you can set the various contours. So you can tell it whether you're doing a 50-50 uh, a contour, whether you're looking at uh, the 54-60s, you know. So uh, you can also configure antenna height, antenna configuration. The only thing it won't do is directionals, but for this application, for the purpose of seeing if you could actually get the DU ratio to a you know to see if it'll work at all this might be a, a beneficial tool so uh just throw that little uh pr link out there and matt is of course paying attention in the background so i am sure that you'll see the uh the link for that come up soon but uh i, I don't think matt's ever not been paying attention someday i'm going to catch him it's it's become my new mission. Now we have talked a lot, and Philip, you'd uh, reference this talking about France. Uh, we've talked a lot about highways, which is really where I'm just going to flick all the little uh, timings ahead. But highways is one of the big areas where single frequency networks are really beneficial because folks more and more, I think, listen mobile than they do stationary. Well, exactly right. And, and in this picture, you can kind of nicely see the interference areas, if, if it's planned out right, there's a small little, you know, two points on the map, really, and, you know, wherever the, the road goes on to the next coverage area, uh, which is different than, than covering an entire community where you have to look at the entire circle. Uh, so certainly that makes it easier. Uh, but the interesting thing that we wanted to highlight here, we brought this up uh, back when I did this presentation in 2017 at NAB. And um, in this particular example, we've already turned on the HD uh, on all of these little boosters for this particular example. Uh, but the interesting thing is a lot of talk about you know, geographic targeting of, of uh, broadcast information these days. And uh, certainly that comes with a, a, a bit of a concern of interference on a code channel. Here's an alternative that we would like to at least bring to your attention. And the HD signal itself is not one signal. It is made up of several what they call logical channels, and they almost stand on their own. So one thing that we could conceptually think about is, uh, for example, you can set up an, an SFN with the P1 logical channel, the main channel in blue on this, on this map, all across the highway, and they're all synchronized together, same content everywhere. But you could potentially turn on another logical channel synchronized to the main broadcast just in select locations and have additional information on those carriers. Mm -hmm. That's and, and that would be a solution that would not cause any additional interference because not only okay. these carriers would not be used, you would only use them in alternate situations, you know, the next right. coverage area over sort of thing. Uh, um, I mean, going beyond that, you could potentially do uh, data services as well. Yeah, like uh, running the PSD. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in the HD system, you can already push your artist experience uh, and uh, PSD into the secondary carriers. So you right. can actually have unique uh, graphics come up in a geographic area. Um, I should add, uh, I got uh, asked to, uh, there, uh, somebody mentioned to me not too long ago that I use a lot of acronyms without necessarily explaining what they are, just assuming folks are know as much as I do. And I don't know that much, but what I know, I know really well. Um, so PSD's program service data, it's basically the RDS or the data signal for the HD secondary channels or for the main channel as far as that goes, but the data service for the HD carriers. Mm, exactly. And then and the artist experience are the, the nice pretty pictures that you can show up in the, in the dashboard, including your station logo and things like that. Right. And uh, th there are folks, uh, some services that'll, that'll run uh, interface to um, GPS and run traffic data, traffic maps as well that uh, yeah. tie in nicely with something like this. Um, over and above this, and, and again, whether you're using HD, and this is something that uh, Kirk might be able to address. If I had, for example, in this picture, four little transmitters, each getting audio through, and, uh, through MPX nodes, 
there's no real reason I couldn't for say I had an accident in one area, I could feed different audio to one of them, couldn't I temporarily? I mean, obviously in the interference zone, it's gonna throw things all to pieces temporarily, but uh, but the, you could do that, couldn't you? Absolutely, you could, yeah. That would probably, uh, if you're feeding micro MPX, since that comes from the stereo generator, you're actually gonna have a separate audio processor uh, uh, with stereo generator. Because uh, once it's packaged up in micro MPX, it's the whole N MPX uh, signal. Now, if you just if you're just feeding uh, uh, HD signals, uh, then you're probably just going to uh, be using a more ordinary audio IP codec to each location, mm -hmm. and then yeah, program insertion uh, wouldn't right. require. I mean, you're doing that pre audio processor anyway, so yeah. uh, and you're going to need a need a separate one. So, so yeah, that that that, that can. Work. That could work. And in the HD world, that kind of comes back to the thing that uh, Geo Broadcast has been petitioning for with the, with the zone casting and specific geographic targeted uh, broadcast, where this is something that would fit into that. Uh, and, and again, whether their technology, any other technology, it's uh, it's it's a cool concept. I'm not getting into the politics of it, not my circus, but uh, but by all means, it's it's just another application. And uh, speaking of applications, so Philip, oh, I'm going. Oh, yeah. Jeff, sure. Jeff, first of all, I'll mention there's a uh, it, in in my neighborhood. There is a Wendy's restaurant that I always forget about. And I, I kind of like Wendy's. There's a couple things I like at Wendy's, but it's in a really oddball little location. You have to actually take a bridge across a rail a railroad tracks to get to it. And it's, so it's on this little peninsula of a hotel that may still be open. I'm not sure. A Wendy's and a exotic car dealership that I just would never go to because I don't have that kind of money, right? Mm -hmm. So I forget about the Wendy's. Well, what if I got in my car? And to me, this is the, the argument for, for geocasting. What if I got in my car, turn the radio on, I'm driving, I'm tooling around my neighborhood, and, and it says, and it says, remember, there's a Wendy's in that weird place you always forget about. <laughs> yep, there you go. And that would absolutely, I'd go buy a Frosty or a single that day. I would. Well, and that's one of the things, like I said, I, I'd stay away from the politics of it, but the ability to have some of the smaller local uh, advertisers in a region that is is kind of cool. Out here, we don't think about it so much because, I mean, you get between the one big city, Halifax, and the next biggest city, Bridgewater, there's one radio station in the middle, and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, we, we hopefully cover that area reasonably well. So wide area coverage uh, over and above uh, localized. Um, Philip, this is something that you've uh, talked about quite a bit with various programs. And uh, this is again, something where uh, SFNs come in very beneficial. Right, yeah, like a lot of national broadcasters, uh, you know, perhaps more geared towards international applications, uh, have a mandate to cover an entire country or an entire state, province, uh, whatnot, with the same audio content. And today they would use three or four frequencies and perhaps reuse them as, as you go across the country. Uh, but you have to use multiple frequencies to do so. With a single frequency network approach, well, of course, you could collapse that all into a single one. And uh, therefore, it is certainly more spectrally efficient. Yeah. And uh, the Jeff, other I'm, advantage... I'm, Oops, sorry. What am I saying? Uh, 20 plus years ago, uh, I got to do some work in France, and they've been doing the, you know, the RDS alternate frequency list for decades there, and their radios handle at least the ones that in the cars that I rode in, they would have actually two front ends in their tuner. And so you could tune to, you know, the brand you wanted to. I was uh, doing some work for an outfit called Vibration. And no matter where we drive in in south of the Paris area, the uh, uh, the Loire region of France, we, we would pick it up from the different transmitters, and it was absolutely seamless. In the yep. U.S., even if you transmit an alternate frequency list, I'm pretty sure that nobody knows how to make their radio do that because it's such a foreign concept to us in the U.S. and probably Canada as, as well. So what I'm saying sure. is the first example here with F1, F2, F3, that that can work great in some markets where they've been doing that. In in the U.S., nobody would would know to do that. Well, and so I've run into situations where folks down here have the alternate frequencies programmed into their RDS, and the challenge becomes that a lot of cars, because it's not been properly set up, as you said, uh, yeah. the receiver will go from one, try to go from the other, and just basically hiccup, choke, and die. Um, yeah. You know, so uh, yeah, a lot of car dealers get this. So I, I've had folks say, "Yeah, this car dealer complained that every time somebody turns to our station, their radio shuts up or whatever." Yeah, 
So, uh, so yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a lot of education required for that. Whereas a single frequency system, I go to 88.7 and just keep on driving. There it is. Yeah. Um, yep. The other advantage is, well, it's not really an advantage. It's the same either way. But again, multiple smaller transmitters over one big transmitter allows you to provide a lot more localized content in an emergency or for geo-targeting, whatever. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of benefit to it. Um, downside, uh, I'm thinking that it costs a fair bit to put up a whole bunch of transmitter sites. Now, now Philip, have you done a cost study on, on like one big stick with continually 30 kilowatt power bill versus a whole bunch of little sticks with two and a half kilowatt power bills? Well, that's a fairly complex question that, that you're raising. <laughs> um, I mean, overall, I think there have been studies that show that it's more energy efficient. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you know, just increasing your transfer of power doesn't necessarily increase your coverage that much. I mean, it's mostly a game of height above terrain. Right. Um, and uh, more power only gives you so much. Um, you know, so certainly I think there's arguments that you can cover the same region with less power, but on the flip side, you have more infrastructure, um, you know, more transmission buildings, more antennas, more STLs. Um, so at some point, you know, there's going to be a cost trade-off. Um, right. You know, one big antenna, one big transfer is probably easier to manage than 10 little ones. Mm -hmm. And I think the big thing that I tell folks with respect to just about everything especially when we get talking about hd whether it's ma3 or whether it's uh, hdfm is it's situational define you need to know what you want to accomplish and then we can help you figure out what works best for you but uh, that may not be what works best for shane for example or for dave or for anybody else so uh, it, it, it's very much you know it does require you doing your homework um, now, flipping ahead, you um, got a couple of slides, and I'll go through these pretty quickly, but uh, you were talking about the, the synchronization and inter interference contours, uh, and this is part of your 2017 paper as well. It is. It's, there's quite a bit of information to cover here, so <laughs> I'd certainly encourage you to, to uh, maybe look at the, the, the bigger paper at some point, too, if you're really interested in that. But this is the worst case situation. We talked about terrain shielding earlier. Well, in this analysis here, there's absolutely none. This is flat Earth. Um, you know, some, some of us still believe in flat Earth, um, <laughs> but here it is. <laughs> that was so, almost a dad joke. See, I told you, Philip. Yes, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> but in this case, you've got a big 25 kilowatt. I think it was this example um, in the middle here, and a little 250 watt booster on the side. And if we're talking about FM and look at the DU ratios and the timing requirements. Um, you can kind of see anything in the red here would be a potential area of, of interference. Um, and there's a faint yellow line on there that you can see. So mm -hmm. that, and between that and the red region, that's the only region that we could potentially recover by aligning the timing. The rest of that is no matter how close we get, how perfectly we synchronize things, like I said before, the physics are still going to get in the way. It's really just this little belt that you could potentially address. Philip, I think it's so important that you point this out, that little yellow belt that's difficult to see on the slide, because it is such a small area that you can make wonderful because of timing. But as soon as you move closer to the main or closer to the booster, that timing changes and mm -hmm. it's no longer valid. And you can't make the timing good over a large, large area. It's, it's, good, in one, it's good in one place. Uh, that that belt right there. And so that's w one of the things that I think that people who don't know uh, think about an on-channel booster, think it's all going to be wonderful. Uh, and, and the timing is critical. Well, the timing is critical, to f especially if your most significant donor lives on that yellow belt. It's very critical. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, if, if, if you can't make it good everywhere unless you have terrain shielding. And that's what this slide is is about. That terrain shielding is is so critical. Flat, right. flat yeah. earth. Yeah, no good. <laughs> so in a 10 microsecond timing margin, that translates approximately to three kilometers of crossover, two miles. Mm -hmm. say. So that's the, the region you can control, but that's it. Yep. Uh, and you can see, particularly with a big power ratio of 25 kilowatts to 250 watts, uh, you know, there's only a small region where the booster will actually be good. Uh, yeah. So you got a very small region where it will be perfectly fine, yep. but then a huge mush region. 
So in, in, a, in a flat terrain situation, an on-channel booster, you know, without terrain shielding will cause you much more interference than it will give you. Now, if your right. most significant donor lives in the little tiny blue circle where, you know, where the translator, where the booster is, well, maybe, maybe that's worth it to you. And no, and, and it's, you know, catfish ponds and pastures and cornfields everywhere else. Okay, well, maybe that, so every situation is really different. Right, exactly. And I mean, I, I had a call and uh, it's very similar to this. They were in a very flat area, um, but they had one bowl in the middle and they wanted the booster to fill the bowl. And I said, that'll work just fine. And they said, I said, so how deep's the bowl? And they go 50 feet. And I said, so you got an antenna? Yeah, yeah. We're going to put our signal at 100 feet up. And I said, uh, no, you're not. No, no, you need to be down. You need to degrade this on purpose in this mm -hmm. situation because you only want to fill almost up to the edge of the bowl because if you go above the bowl, then you're creating exactly what Philip's drawn here. So, yeah, that's, uh, again, like Kirk said, it's very situational. Now, you'd mentioned this before, and I wanted you to clarify it. If you're mono and don't have pilots to deal with, things improve. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I've got this information. I haven't done any particular studies on mono myself. We looked at stereo quite, quite a bit. Uh, but the ITU has some reference, uh, in they've, they've done that in terms of trying to figure out what the uh, co-channel and adjacent channel inference situations are for mono. And using those parameters, uh, you know, it, it, the inference zone becomes much, much smaller. You can see this, the big red area has gone into a small little region. An interesting thing there is that even the remaining power from the main starts to engulf your booster again at the far end. So it actually becomes the dominant uh, one uh, again at some point. Well, that, now, quick question on that. Uh, do both transmitters need to be in mono or can one of them be in stereo? I assume would, the best. Right. I mean, ideally, we, we say the entire MPX has to be identical. So if, the, if one of them is mono, the other one should be as well. However, there have been studies out there that have mixed and matched. Um, I can't personally... Uh, contribute any information there, but uh, it, it right. has been to work as well. So both mono is ideal and then varying uh, results depending. Uh, exactly. One of the other things you looked at, and this was really the uh, the concept of, of your paper, was uh, looking at HD synchronization. Right, exactly. So in this particular case here, I kind of left in just a little bit of the, the red in, in the back just to sort of see um, well, I wanted to, really what I wanted to show is the two yellow lines, uh, and you know the, the the yellow line towards the main transfer remains about the same, uh, but because we've got larger timing margins, we can now collapse. Uh, we can now have another yellow line behind it, and we can entirely collapse the uh, the interference zone, um, and you know we we can even eliminate the last little bit there. But it was just shown for a demonstration that essentially. Now we, we can cover the entire region. Right. And I mean, that's one of those things, again, with a, either a bit of terrain shielding or a little bit of uh, creative use of directional antennas, you could uh, potentially almost eliminate that. Exactly. And, exactly. and that's something that we haven't really talked about in this at all, because there's not really, I don't think, a whole lot of work done on it. But I, I do have a customer who's running a main and a, a on-frequency booster, and they're using uh, Yaggies. They're basically steering to minimize the uh, the overlap. And, uh, you know, th that's uh, one of those they just – now, again, one receiver to another, your results will vary. So uh, you you definitely look at the uh, the most significant donor aspect of that for sure. Kirk, I'm going to be using that phrase for the rest of my career. Thank you very much. Uh, most significant donor will stick with me forever. So beyond this, Philip, you talked about cranking the IBOC up even higher. Right, exactly. Um, and I, I guess in this case, it, the interesting thing, like we mentioned before, the DU ratios um, in FM, you know, 20 dB, 1%, collapse to about 4 to 7 dB uh, for HD. Uh, so what that allows you to do, you can actually crank up the the, the, the IBOC power on both the main and the booster. Um, or, or potentially, you know, it, or, or the other concept would be you could keep it the same as at the main. You don't touch the main. Uh, but perhaps we want to increase the injection of HD at the booster. 
so that we minimize the amount of FM that we have to deal with. Um, but we still want to maintain a little bit so we can cover the, the, the community of in question. Uh, but we potentially increase the eyeball carriers and therefore get a larger uh, capture or a, a larger coverage area with that. that. That's really what we're getting at with this. Okay. So one of the questions I had, and while I'm on the HD side, I'm going to have to uh, grab my phone and flick to it because otherwise I will mess it up because it's, there we go. Um, I know he's not on the, uh, not logged in at the moment, but I assume he'll probably catch the archive. Uh, I got uh, asked if we plan on adopt, adopting the industry standard HDSFN ALFN based method as implemented by Xpre and one of our competitors. Um, uh, that's Greek to me, so I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to put you on the spot with it. Right, exactly. Um, and that's a very, very detailed question, of course, uh, and it goes down to the uh, specific implementation. Um, yes, there is a, uh, an industry implementation of the ALFN time synchronization. Uh, that's, as, as there certainly is, uh, that is a concept that is out there. We've gone a little bit of a different approach where we essentially time tag the input to the output of the HD system, not on an L1 frame boundary uh, as that implementation does, but simply on a pure throughput delay. And we found that is uh, a more consistent way to also manage the, uh, the analog FM with it, because we, we ensure that we have the same throughput delay, uh, not just, uh, you know, no matter which way you restart the exporter to the exciter and all that sort of thing, it's always the same fixed throughput delay. And therefore you can set up your FM SFN independently from the uh, HD SFN, and then the diversity delay between the FM and HD also stays fixed. Okay. Uh, and we were not sure that that would necessarily be guaranteed in the L1 frame alignment. Right. Now, that was uh, just like I say, I tried to hit all the questions that uh, come in in the advance uh, registrations as well, and that one was one that I knew uh, was still there. So thank you very much for that. But now, there's back... one more point there, Jeff, on, on that sort of yeah. question here. You know, the reason probably why the, the question was asked is about interoperability between different transmitters. Mm -hmm. And one thing that is certainly true, particularly for the FM, is you really want to have a homogeneous exciter transmitter architecture. Um, mm -hmm. Mix and match doesn't work here. There's right. different delays through exciters. Uh, we, we, we can't guarantee that we will have the same throughput delay, even if you apply the in the analog FM at the same time between our exciter and a third party exciter, there's no guarantee what the delay through the exciter is. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the end, uh, I don't know how important an industry standard is for this application because you really want to be homogeneous. Right, so it's less critical that you have any one or other standard involved if you've got all of one system installed for this particular Exactly. Situ or for the, for any particular installation. So this is a uh, couple of slides here where you were talking about increasing, and I apologize, I just realized that I totally messed up uh, fixing the uh, frequency designations on the bottom of the of the chart. So uh, we'll blame my poor graphics rendering for that. But uh, talking about the elevated IBOC. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, Xperia Ubiquity at the time uh, did some experiments, and the question was can we have an HD only booster? You know, all kinds of challenges with the FM. Why don't we just sidestep the problem and just don't turn on the FM at the booster? Um, and the, the answer is that uh, even though there's still some FM coming from the main, it's likely very low uh, or much, much lower at the booster than um, anywhere else in, in the area. So the risk is that you will be drowning out an analog FM receiver with the HD power. Now, it depends on the receiver. If they're very selective, uh, they may still pick up the FM just fine from the main. Uh, but if, if, it's less, uh, if it's less selective, then, um, you know, it, the HD will start to interfere with a very, very small residual FM in there. So the recommendation is that we do want to maintain at least some degree of FM so that, that receivers don't get overpowered. However, we may not be limited to the minus 10 dB limit that exists, we could potentially go equal power FM and HD. Uh, so that, that's something that could be explored, but it's not uh, certainly anything that uh, that is authorized today. Right. 
And, and then, as you said, IBOC only is uh, probably less a uh, less a solution. And, and especially these days, at, at this point in the game, I mean, even in the biggest markets, you're still under 40% receiver penetration for HD. They're they're moving up quickly, but uh, but still, that's something you know you need to consider. Again, that uh, most significant donor aspect. That's going to become my new boom, Kirk. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll apologize in advance for beating the daylights out of this particular uh, phrase. Um, all right, we are at the top of the hour. We hit our hour. It's rare for me to hit the post like that, but uh, closer than I have ever done before. Kirk Harnack, uh, final thoughts? My final thought is we didn't get to talk about the actual imp implementation in uh, Boston that Grady Motes did. Uh, the one thing I would note is that uh, what they did was they took three fully licensed, fully separated uh, FM stations, and they're feeding them with a micro MPX technology. That's great, that's fine. Um, they are adjusting the buffer at each one to get them time aligned, uh, depending on their internet provider and, and whatever delays they may have in getting to each of these transmitter sites. But there's one more thing that, that they're doing. Uh, you know, in the FM band, in the FM, with your FM station, you are, your carrier must be plus or minus two kilohertz from your assigned frequency. And in order to improve capture ratio, uh, Grady Motes found that if he and, and today's today's transmitters are you know, fully stable. I mean, if you set it to be 1,950 hertz above assignment, you are legal, and it'll stick there. And so, uh, one transmitter will be plus 1,950 hertz from assigned. The next transmitter in the chain, and there will be an interference zone between them, will be minus 1950 hertz from assigned. So that just, I don't know, I don't have the empirical evidence of how much that improves capture ratio, but it does somewhat improve the capture ratio. So they'll have a smaller area of interference between these two transmitters, which are not otherwise synchronized at all in terms of the modulation uh, or the exact precise timing of the audio. So that's the technique that they've that they've used there uh, on these fully spaced uh, FM stations. Right. And again, situational. What works in one? Very situational. Know. Yeah. But 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 no, that that's a cool idea. Now, Philip, uh, your your final thoughts. Well, I think that the one takeaway with SFNs is that uh, analog FM is challenging. And you know, some of the tricks that you mentioned there, Kirk, are great, but there's always going to be a challenge with, with analog FM. And while, while we're still in analog FM days or hybrid FM HD days, we're going to be faced with this challenge. Mm -hmm. But when, when the day comes when we go all digital, that's when SFNs will really start to shine. Yeah. yeah. And it's one of those things more and more where we can, uh, between the IBOC levels or the HD injection levels and uh, with a little bit of shielding, et cetera. I mean, you could make it pretty much seamless. And uh, you had done, if I'm not mistaken, Philip, you'd done a uh, test uh, set up with a station in California. It was USC? Uh, yeah, KUSC. That was uh, the test we did in 2017. And we were able to demonstrate seamless coverage between uh, the, the two communities of interest. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it works quite well. Since then, we've installed uh, a couple more systems. and. Uh, so far, so good, as far as I can tell. Good, good. That's what I like to hear. So on that note, I want to uh, remind everybody that this webinar, as with all of our webinars, will be archived. Um, I'm going to throw in a little plug for uh, Kirk's uh, side gig as uh, This Week in Radio Tech, because uh, Kirk also does a whole lot of these stuff, and he gets uh, people a lot more entertaining than, than me, for sure. Um, although I think I've actually gotten, uh, gotten uh, called up once or twice, too. So. Uh, uh, you, you, you've been a guest, uh, Phil's been a, been a guest at explaining different technology, so you can go back, just do a Google search for Twert and Phil Schmid, or Twert and Jeff Welton, and there you go. Or, or Twert and just about any topic you could think of. So, so <laughs> no, so. it's an, it, well, it's an excellent resource, Kirk, and uh, more Thanks. and more, anything that improves the education is critical. Yeah. Um, so our stuff's all archived on the webinars or on our YouTube channel. Uh, Twert, again, like Kirk said, you can Google that. Uh, we've got a Waves newsletter. Last one came out a couple of weeks ago. So by all means, uh, go look for that. Anybody has any ideas for future TTT, Transmission Talk Tuesday webinar topics, or Waves articles, anything like that, fire me off an email. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me just about anywhere except at the dinner table at the moment. But uh, we'll resolve that in a couple of seconds. On that note, folks, I want to thank you very, very much. Uh, Kirk Harnack from TELUS Alliance, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Jeff. And Phil Schmidt, thank you very much for being with us.
Oh, a pleasure. And biggest thank you to you folks for giving us an hour of your time plus a couple of minutes. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time. Uh, by the way, before I forget, I think we are, let's see, this is, I think we're off next week. So we'll see you again the first week of April. But on that note, thank you and have a great day. Bye now.